Is there anybody left? There's a lot of people left. Okay, good. Well, I've got three cases I think are interesting, they're worthy of discussion, and they all have 90% stenoses. Okay. So, so uh, here are my disclosures. I'm going to show you three cases. We ought to ask people what the, you, they think the stenoses are. That would be actually fun to do. Ask the people. Uh, I'm going to ask these two gentlemen here to my left how severe these lesions are, and they can tell us. There's no mysteries here. These are just interesting cases. So let me, uh, let me start with the easiest one first. How's that? Okay. I haven't seen this one in a while. So multivessel disease in a patient before prostate surgery. This happens to be angiograms occurring in a 69-year-old physician who's pre-op for as surgery. That's often the case. He has angina, some atypical features, and he had ischemic EKG changes. I think the left anterior descending artery demonstrates multiple uh, lumpy bumpies, an apical lesion of some severity, which they can tell us, and uh, a diagonal branch here, which is disease, but a tight, I think, 90% circumflex stenosis. So you can, you can tell me how tight you think that circumflex is. I'll show you another view, but... If you, if you push a wire there and get a clue, it's 90%. Okay. Okay. <laughs> But because in, the y is in clinical practice, I'm sure there are a number of individuals in the audience who might also agree that's tight. And uh, I think this is a fundamental difference between these. Let me show you another view. So here's what we're working with. We think this is not important. We think this little branch may be the cause of his ischemia. We're not going to work in the apex of this man's heart. Uh, we're going to actually try and do as little as possible. And uh, what do we have here? We have some more views. So he has plaque and the LAD, and he has that circumflex lesion over here, here. I don't know, is that 90%? Greg? In, in the, the circumflex? Yeah. The mid distal right circumflex? Here, right here, right there. Right yeah, there. I mean, I think most people, it looks like there is a skip lesion. It's, it's pretty tight. I mean, QCA would probably read it at about 82%. Okay, so let me ask, who uses but... QCA in their daily practice again? Raise your hands. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> But I think that I, you know, I think most people in their cath reports, uh, you know, will call that a ninety percent lesion, even though I agree, you know. Okay. And I so, and I think you put a wire across that. I think there'd be a good chance that yeah, it would decrease flow. That, that will be the test, probing with the guide. Okay. Wire. And I can tell you that that lesion doesn't you, really. You don't need, need to do QCA for this kind of thing. It nor FFR. I agree. Okay. Now, his other Thank problem you. here is this right coronary stenosis, and uh, of course the question is. Do we need to do multiple stents, no stents, leave this alone, treat it medically, do virtual histology? He's going to have an operation in a short period of time. So uh, easy problem, easy answer, do IVUS, right? If it's not flow limiting, don't touch it. If it is flow limiting, treat it. I think it's a very simple statement. So uh, the, not tic, to the tick fed is probably that. 10% stenosis in the mid right corner. Right yeah, there. the TICFA maybe, but he's going to do okay. So uh, we're going to, these are the still frames of the lesion in question. We're going to treat the CERC for sure. I just want to know whether we should treat this one. What do you think, Greg? Percent diameter narrowing again by so, QCA, eyeball QCA? Yes, yeah, so I'd, I'd call that a 70% stenosis. Okay. I don't, and this illustrates the very personal point of all of us who deal with angiograms that the description by a diameter stenosis is weak, limited, and uh, yields to flow. So we did an FFR. And uh, any, any guesses? Did you give nitro, by the way, before that first angiogram? We did. We did okay. give nitro. Any guesses? 0.85? Of course it is. I wouldn't be showing to you if it was different. It's 0.88. And uh, we left this alone, treated the circ. Took away the ischemia. Now, somebody in my question said, why treat him at all, right? Just give him beta blockers and go. But our practice in many cases is if they come for an angiogram, they have significant lesions, we try and eliminate the ischemia to make the surgery safer. And uh, that seemed to work. So that was the take-home lesson. Which, of course, lesson. has never been proven. Uh, I know you don't do that in your well, practice. No, no, we always do it. But, oh, okay. it is, but it's fair to say that it has never been proven, and especially studies that have always shown anything except for large amounts of ischemia have you know, there have been a, a bunch now of randomized trials, and it's never shown to improve outcomes. So we have to be honest, even though it certainly makes sense to, that, for us to do it. 
Okay, let me show you another case. I think this one's a little more fun. Can, can I ask a question to the audience on this right coronary artery? Would go, who would go immediately for direct stenting? Because that's a real question. Good question. Who directs stents in the audience? For that type for of that lesion? lesion? Yeah. And, and what's the advantage, again, of direct stenting? No direct stenting of no direct stenting, but it seems to me an important lesion. <laughs> and if I have some functional argument uh, coming from an exercise testing of the butamine stress and so, I, I, would, I would go for the treatment. I mean, if I have nothing, probably I would do a, a pressure Y. But even with the pressure Y giving me 88, I will be uh, uneasy because what is the plaque burden of that? If we start to see uh, 3.9 with a plaque burden of 70% and, and, uh, and the FFR of 0 0.88, I, I don't know anymore what to do with finding. This so is, let's, let's go wait to, a minute, go wait to, a minute, no, wait no, a minute. No, this say, is not an ischemia producing lesion. Now, you're not okay. inferring that we should treat these non ischemic lesions just because they have plaque in them, are no, no, you? I'm, I'm impressed by the argument of, uh, of uh, Bernard who tried to reconcile uh, hemodynamic severity and vulnerability. And, and there's many other things that you could say in nature with case Lager. We mentioned that. Uh, they are an increase in high shear stress in the upstream of the lesion, which activate plasminogen, and the plasmin activate the prometalloproteinase, and the metalloproteinase is a factor of rupture. So you can make the problem as complicated as you want. But in five years, we know what happens to this deferred lesion. It does great. It has a less than 1% event rate with that, that lesion. FFR no well, to well let me let, let me modify that. Bit because you have a statin on the top of it. Okay, yeah. but I, you I don't think more it is that. now. I think we have more information than we did ten years ago from defer, and I do think that if you did Ivis and virtual histology on that, and you saw that that was a seventy-five percent plaque burden, that was a thin cap fiber atheroma, it would not have a one percent rate at five years. Two percent. No, absolutely not. I don't think that's true. This is the question. If, if it is something uh, which has no remodeling, okay, which is green, okay, and which is restrict, I would be very at ease to let the, the, the lesion yeah. like it is. But if by accident you have this huge remodeling that I cannot see on the angio and I have all the other characteristics, I mean, today, September 24, I am a little bit in doubt. Yeah. Sorry, but that's the way it is. Yeah. I think doubt's a good thing. But you still have to make a decision. Do you want me to stent that lesion? Did you ivis it? I mean, that would I eyeballed be... it. I eyeballed it. I mean, it's... Did I ivis it's, it? It's halfway. Does it need ivis? In this situation, you're trying to get the patient through, through prostate surgery. And obviously, if the FFR was negative, then that suggests he's not going to have an ischemic risk for prostate surgery. And so it's fine not to treat it then. The question is what will happen in the future with it. Yeah. I, I think from the data we have... Physiologically, it'll do very well. Yeah, but you can't ignore the new data more. You're living in the past. We just showed you prospect from 700 patients to suggest that if you have a non-culprit lesion like that with a plaque burden greater than 70% and a TICFA, you've got a 15% rate in five years. That's not 1% in 15% in three years. That's not 1% in five years. You can't ignore the new data. So if should it's I, pathologic interval thickening, so then should it's I dent it? If you, if, I don't know. The well, well that's is, I, the question I need well, to answer Well, we don't to. know, but I'm saying that I can at least prognostically tell you it's not going to be a risk for the patient for prostate surgery, but we're talking about for the next three to five years that if you saw a lot of plaque in a TICFA, there's going to have a one in six chance of developing angina or possibly worse. There's no randomized trial to tell me if I can make that prognosis better by stenting it. So, of course, you know. You know, we've, we've deferred. You are one step further because you have randomized. Here we just have a longitudinal stud study telling you that maybe it, ca it caused a problem. So the next step has been said will be to randomize this lesion. Okay. I'm going to show you another lesion. Okay. Show us another one. Show you another lesion. Okay. This is one I created. So we're staying this late, everybody, right? Okay. I won't, I won't keep you too late. So 59-year-old man had uh, anterior T-wave inversions. He came to the emergency room two days of chest pressure. He's got risk factors of hypertension, hypercholesterol. His exam labs and chest x-ray were normal. He came with a great story and new deep anterior T-wave changes. And I don't think it's a mystery what's going on. He has a, a proximal LAD. I would not do a pressure Y in that lesion, I can tell you. <laughs> because I have a TME2 flow. You know what? I didn't do one in that lesion. 
I didn't do one in that lesion. He didn't need anything. He has a very tight lesion, but he has a difficult artery for us. This is a, a, a diffuse segment, it's kind of tubular around, and it involves a part of the artery that crosses over this large diagonal branch with no uh, obvious lesion in it. Here's the other view. Again, angiography is difficult for osteal uh, locations at times, but that LED, I think, is unquestionably a problem, and we went ahead and treated it. Now, let me show you another view, another view, another view, another view. Okay, still frames. Good to have randomized. Okay, sorry. here's yeah, the LAO, right. I'm sorry, the REO uh, caudal. Here's the uh, LAO caudal. The circumflex is non-dominant. The right is very big. I'll show you the right. This is AP cranial. This is REO of the LAO of the right coronary artery. So there's no mysteries here. We're going to go ahead and treat this. This was a guy with unstable angina, T-wave changes, even though he didn't make uh, enzymes. And uh, although it looks like three simple little frames, this took about an hour because getting a wire to make the bends, there was a lesion in the LED beyond the diagonal ostium that took off. We dilated. We laid in, with the help of a buddy wire, some very long stents here. And it was a little bit complicated. We were able to manage it. But here's what happened after we finished stenting. So I know this isn't 90%. Is it 80%? 70%? Do I hear 50? 50? Going once. So I pinched the diagonal branch. And this is probably a relatively common scenario. And uh, so should we just go in there and put in another stent? Leave it alone. Leave it it's alone? It's fine. It's absolutely I mean, the, fine. The, the Korean people will force you to do a pressure wise systematically, and it's clear that you will it probably is. find a, a 0.92 or 4.94. Yeah, if you look at the flow in these side branches, even faster than in the LED. Yeah. So, so is this okay. a non issue to the operators? Anybody other than the two sitting up here concerned about anything? You would do FFR. Me too, but that's somebody else. So, anybody else? I'm concerned. more worried about the proximal yeah, stent the proximal that I want to <laughs> Don't, yeah, don't mean, worry, boys. It's not over. Okay. Don't worry. Let me just reassure you that, indeed, jailed you, you, side branches. You will have to make at least a pullback because uh, <laughs> I, I, I agree that the segment which is prior to the stenting has a uh, peculiar appearance there. We agree. And actually, I'm going to use IVUS, a, a rare occurrence. But let me see what I can do. So we did FFR, not to beat you guys up. Come on, I know it's in there. There it is. Okay, so we did IVUS. The branch shows what was predicted by the flow, but it doesn't always uh, come out that way. So 86, I think, is good enough to leave alone. Uh, we did IVUS and realized we were underdeployed. There was more material. We went back with larger balloons, high pressure, and got a very nice results. And uh, I think you would find that acceptable. We left the diagonal branch alone. So just to, an example quickly, so to assuage any in uncertainty about what to do with a pinch jail diagonal, you have a nice tool to solve that problem. And uh, there's some good long-term data by Dr. Bon Kuhn from Korea who presented at this meeting at the bifurcation session. And indeed, we can use FFR to help us manage this. I'll show you one more case and we'll be and done with me for the night. You're probably done with me before I got up here, but... Let me see what I can do. So last case for my colleagues at the table. This is a, another uh, elderly gentleman who has dyspnea on exertion, new onset AFib, but he has small, non-small cell lung carcinoma on chemotherapy and hypertension. He's treated for that. He has a relatively uh, uh, unremarkable uh, exam except for his lung findings, and they plan to do a lobectomy at some unknown date in the near future, and his uh, treating physicians performed a dobutamine stress echo to assess whether he had cardiac dysfunction as a responsible component of his uh, dyspnea rather than just lung disease. And indeed, it turned out to be a positive anterior wall and mid-anterior wall abnormal echocardiographic stress test with dobutamine. So here's his uh, coronary anatomy. And he has, again, risk factors, as you saw. And he has multiple lesions in his LAD. And uh, there are none so critically narrowed that I'd get excited about it at, uh, on the face of it, but multiple serial lesions and long diffuse segments can be ischemia producing. Okay, let me show you another view because everybody wants to know what it looks like in another view. And there's suspicious areas, but I can't tell you on the angiogram which is the most severe. 
you can always guess, and sometimes you guess right. I don't think we should be doing this by guesswork completely, although we do a lot of things by guesswork. That's a good case for pullback of a pressure wire. It is a good case for pullback. Okay, so we have these lesions. I think I'll go quickly through the angiography here. So we have these four areas roughly in the artery. And of course, you can't assess this without pulling back and seeing where your biggest gradients are. Perhaps we'll get lucky and identify the single spot and maybe just put in a small stent, treat the ischemia we believe is producing the anterior wall problem. Now, I'm not going to show you the right coronary artery yet, but I'll tell you it's not normal, and we're going to come to it. So if, if I were to ask anybody to guess which lesion, I'm sure we could get a nice uh, spectrum of responses. The pressure wires pass distally. Here's the summed FFR across all four lesions. We do a pullback and we identify the fact that the gradient occurs only at lesion number three, no change at lesion number four, then the step up occurs and then no change past lesions one and two. So we're going to put a small stent in lesion number three and of course we can localize where that lesion exists by the pressure wire again. Uh, angiographically it looks good. Now Arguably, we might want to IVUS everything, and of course, there's a ton of plaque in here, and the plaque burden is going to be sufficient, but the physiology is quite good. So I'm not excited about treating these other things at the moment, despite what the prospect study tells me, for this man with lung cancer. Now, let me just turn our attention. So we took care of what I think is the LED, and here is another problem. Uh, somewhat equally disturbing because remember we just relied on a stress echo that showed significant LED wall motion abnormality but not much right coronary abnormality. Should I ignore this right coronary artery? Is this a 90% stenosis? It's no. A, it's a a 72-75. By QCA I, I, or I, eyeball? I'll give you 80. By QCA, right. 75. 80, 75, I hear 60, 65 right over here. Okay. So you get the picture, but here's the other problem. You're back in the 60s, that's for, for sure, yeah? Should we back leave? to the future. Yeah, back to the future. So we also have another hazy, questionable area down yeah, here. Yeah, that's very... Uh, what do you think, that, Patrick? That deserves uh, imaging. Okay. So uh, huh? you, you can't do physiology assessment of this distal lesion without relieving the obstruction of the proximal. We plan to balloon, reassess the total, come back and treat, treat, and see what happens. So this is a, another example of serial lesion, multivessel disease, where I think we're getting some help. Now, could you arbitrarily put a stent here and here without any other ancillary activity? Absolutely yes. Uh, but if you wanted to see what you, what you really needed to do, we did that. So let me show you. Eventually. Culprit lesions or target lesions. Resting ratio across both lesions is already ischemic. You don't need to induce hyperemia. You're already there for, for the ischemic spot. We, we dilated, uh, measured, dilated again, and now we'll make one more final measurement here. We're still, I think, in the ischemic zone after relieving proximal ischemia, so we're going to go ahead and just treat both. And after treating both, we have a nice pullback with 0.92 all the way through this uh, artery across the, the uh, lesion. So I think that uh, this case demonstrates multiple lesions in several different areas. This is the serial assessment, and actually most of our coronary disease to some extent involves this serial disease because it's really a diffuse process, but we're dealing with maybe focal accumulations. So let me stop right there. And this is my last slide. Whoops, it's all gone. I guess that's the end of me, right? Oh, okay. So I just had one, one more provocative slide for us here. I, I, we heard some really great data about the FAME study. And when you look at cost-effectiveness data, there are very few studies that we've dealt with in interventional cardiology that really have produced clinical effectiveness at lower cost or even slightly higher cost. And there are many things that are higher cost and more effective. Bypass has its benefits. Drug-eluting stents over uh, bare metal stents have 
their effectiveness. Medical therapy is down here, but it's probably not as cost effective. But FAME has localized itself down in this lower quadrant when you look at that bootstrap examination. And uh, I think this is something to take home, both for local treatment and for national treatment. I think it's really worthwhile to consider the benefits of a uh, objectively driven multi-vessel coronary interventional approach. Thank you.